to our members webinar on breeding with the topic should I or shouldn't I uh, and what to do next. So tonight we're going to be covering um, a few things. The first thing is just a general overview of um, a mare's cycle or her season. Um, then we're going to go into some different methods of breeding available, um, pros and cons of these methods, uh, and then basically the process involved in all of them. Uh, and then we'll have some question time at the end if anyone has any questions. So that's basically what we'll be doing tonight. So let's get started. So the mare's cycle, um, mares are what we call seasonal breeders, so they don't cycle, most mares don't cycle all year round, they, it's um, to do with the circadian rhythm and the day length, so horses as the day length starts to um, lengthen they get an uh, increase in melatonin levels which basically kicks their brain into um, the, or their hormones into um, cycling and, and breeding uh, and that happens at, in springtime so as the day length gets longer the mare starts cycling. So when they start cycling their estrus cycle lasts on average 21 days so every 21 days your mare will ovulate in that um, spring, spring to summer so normally from about August through to uh, March, April is when the mare tends to, to come into season and start cycling so every, one, tw every 21 days in that period uh, they will ovulate and potentially be able to create a pregnancy. So. The only thing with this is each mare is different. Uh, some mares can cycle all the way through winter uh, and it's not necessarily something wrong with your horse, um, they just don't have a stronger um, suppression with the day length and uh, things like that. So it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with your horse if she does cycle through winter. Some horses will keep the behavioural um, traits of being in season but yet they don't um, ovulate or, or cre uh, le lose an ovum to, um, to create pregnancy. So even though your mare may outwardly show signs of cycling, sometimes that doesn't correlate um, internally and, and the hormones are all over the shop. So some horses won't go in foal in winter, but then others, if they're running with the stallion, you know, can conceive um, sometimes. So um, it really does depend. Um, every mare is different. Um, so again, the time of the year is the spring to spring and summer is really when they're in their most fertile um, hormonally um, when they'll accept a stallion. So and mares are bred when they're in season um, and normally this is in that 21 day cycle, normally five to seven days of that is when they will accept a stallion. So they have a good amount of edema, their cervix is open and they, they can um, they can accept a stallion and potentially ovulate and, and create a pregnancy. So the exact timing can be different for each method of, um, of breeding that you choose uh, and sometimes we like to inseminate or place the semen in really close to ovulation, sometimes it's post ovulation and then if it's live cover sometimes you can, the semen can be in there for several days before ovulation. So the exact timing of breeding your mare can vary depending on the, the, the choices you use. Um, so we use um, what we call palpation, so we, we feel um, your mare's reproductive tract per rectum. Um, the horse's anatomy allows us to enter the rectum uh, and the reproductive tract sits very closely um, beneath that rectum so, so that we're not entering um, bacteria and things like that. We don't go into the vagina or the vulva, we do go per rectum. Um, and we also use an ultrasound technique which is um, sound waves um, bouncing um, across the um, membranes and things like that. So ultrasound is the most common technique now uh, when looking at mare's reproductive tracts. Um, so it often requires multiple ultrasound examinations. Um, so you don't often just get the one scan and, and know exactly that your mare must be covered in 10 days time or um, you know or the next day um, unless your mare's in season sometimes it can you can require a few scans um, to predict when she's going to be best needing to be covered. Um, the other thing when you're um, thinking about breeding is 
take into consideration the age of your mare and her breeding history. So mares are just like humans in as much as they do go through menopause um, and their fertility does drop once they get into that middle to late uh, teens. So if you have a mare that's 18, 19 and she's starting to get a bit old to ride and you think, you know what, I'll get a foal out of her, sometimes it's just not that easy. So, you know, if you are, if you do have a good competition mare or, um, you know, you would like to get a foal out of her, don't leave your run too late um, to do so. Uh, it, it's not impossible to get older mares in, in um, foal, but sometimes it, it can be tricky and, and costly. So if you are thinking of breeding, just consider your mare's um, age. And again, if you have a mare that you know has had a foal or two before, um, it's really important to just see if you can get an, uh, an idea of their breeding history, if they've ever lost a foal or um, had problems um, going into foal. These are things to consider uh, if they have lost foals before, their uterus may not be um, set up to, to carry pregnancy. So they're exactly like humans, some, some women can't um, conceive and same with horses. So um, going in with an open mind and understanding that it may not happen, I think is the best way to go. So just consider the age of your mare and her breeding history. And along those lines as well, if your mare is really young, um, that sort of one to two years of age, the mare, she hasn't matured herself, her bones are still growing and I think putting mares in, uh, fillies in foal um, can be a little bit irresponsible um, if, uh, if they haven't finished growing themselves. Their pelvises are quite small um, and they are notoriously um, problem mares for foaling and things like that. So I certainly think younger mares are, um, are, shouldn't be bred um, until they're four years of age. So they've reached their, their um, maturity as far as growing goes uh, and, uh, and the, there's less complications that way. So the young mare um, is, can be a, a problem as well. And um, and also me, uh, fillies can actually start cycling at about nine to ten months of age. So if you have colts and fillies running together, um, colts can impregnate at about six months of age. So um, just be cautious of um, of running young stock together if they're colts and fillies. Uh, most fillies don't cycle until they're 12 to 18 months of age. And the same with colts, they don't tend to. But you can get those outliers that. Um, are just a little bit um, advanced for the majority, so just bear that in mind if you are, if you do have young ones um, housed together. Um, the other thing to remember is the international standard is actually 2.1 cycles for a pregnancy, so that means that it may take two and a bit attempts to get your mare in foal. So um, don't sort of be expecting, you know, boy goes to girl or girl goes to boy, um, they have sex and come home pregnant. Sometimes. Um, especially maiden mares, they can react to the semen for the first time and get fluid and, uh, and often you'll need that second attempt to get um, maiden mares and even older mares, um, sometimes they um, you know, react and you need to treat them a bit more intensively. Um, and then the statistics is actually 65% of mares go in foal on their first attempt. So that's great if you've got an easy breeder and she just has to look at the stallion and go in foal, um, that's fantastic. But some horses um, do take a little bit more. So if you're in that 35% that don't get first time, don't be thinking you're the only one. So um, I was quite surprised that the statistics were at 65%, but um, that's the international standard for first, first attempt pregnancy rates. So it's not all about the girl. Um, you do need to consider the stallion that you're going to send your mare to. Um, and I think this is a point where a lot of people um, may just get a little bit carried away and, and decide, you know, that they just want to go to the stallion because he lives down the road or he's a pretty colour or things like that. You need to choose the stallion because they're pedigree is good, um, so they're not too closely related to your mare and also that they don't have any um, issues, so they, you know, they do have straight legs and they're not um, parrot mouths and things like that. So just because they're close to you um, or they're cheap, sometimes they can be cheap for a reason. So just have a little bit of, um, do a little bit of research on the stallion you'd like to go to. Clearly, you know, everyone wants to go to the really expensive stallion but can't afford it. So finances do come into play but we do find we have a few clients that just want to breed to the stallion because they don't have to go far, it's going to be cheap for them and, and sometimes 
they're just not the best options to um, to go for. So um, they do say that um, if the if they're closely related and they um, you have a healthy foal, it's called line breeding. But if you have a foal that has deformities, then that's called inbreeding. So again, knowing your mare's genetics um, is is quite handy. Um, if you've acquired the mare and haven't really got an idea of her breeding. Sometimes it's best to not go for a purebred, um, especially in the quarter horses and things like that. We we do see some diseases because um, they are too interbred. Um, so that's um, sometimes it's better to cross them with a you know if you've got a thoroughbred mare and you don't know her breeding, um, put her over a quarter horse or a stock horse and um, and vice versa. So um, if you don't have a, a good idea of their pedigree, then um, you know, it is better to be safe than sorry. Um, and it's also um, some stallions, you know, you might have your heart set on a stallion and it lives, you know, two days of drive away from you. So your choice of stallion will sometimes be the decision as to whether you have to do live cover, um, get chilled semen sent to you or frozen semen. Um, if you are if you have your heart set on a warm blood, that's in Germany, I can't um, imagine many people being able to afford to fly their mare to Germany for live cover. Um, so usually those options are frozen semen. So um, which is one of the positives for frozen semen. It does gives you does give you a better um, genetic base to uh, to choose from. Um, and I think the other important thing is when you are deciding whether to breed um, with your mare. Stallions don't fix problems that you've got. So if your mare has uh, a lameness issue, or um, you know is, is a little bit short in the body, or you know her her neck's upside down, or things like that, I just don't think you um, can expect the stallion to to fix these things. So you really need to start with uh, with good good stock to begin with. And um, you know if the mare's not a very good competition mare. I think you know expecting her to breed to a, a top stallion, you really can't be, you know, you can't be guaranteed to have a um, a, a good um, a good outcome. The, the stallion can't fix miracles, so just bear that in mind um, when you when you're choosing to, whether you want to breed with your mare or not. So the first technique that we'll go over is what we call live cover, um, and this is what it sounds like, that it's live, so there's no boxes or interference uh, involved. So your mare um, visits the stallion or the stallion visits your mare and uh, and you know that um, is often the, the biggest pro for that is it's the cheapest because you usually only have the transport to get your mare to the stallion. Um, but the, the downsides to live cover is um, you have a very high chance of getting an STI, so a sexually, sexually transmitted infection. Um, and yes, horses have these too. Um, not um, and, and a lot of the uh, STIs that your mare can um, catch or can give to the stallion can also um, prevent her going into foal and uh, and lower her fertility rate. So they, there are some um, serious um, transmissible diseases out there in horses. So um, live cover is where these um, are most most obvious. Um, another con, another negative for live cover is um, if you just throw your mare in the paddock with the stallion, sometimes he may take a disliking to her or he could be rough, um, which can cause injuries to your mare. So if you have an overzealous stallion that doesn't um, doesn't mind whether she's in season or not, you can get um, injuries of you know tearing of the cervix or perforation of the cervix, um, which is pretty horrific to see uh, your mare with um, blood after being covered um, by an overzealous stallion. So your injury, the injury to your mare. Um, is a valid um, concern. The other thing is injuries to the stallion. Uh, if your mare is a little bit um, prudish and doesn't like what's going on, she can often give a nice big kick um, to the stallion to warn him to stay away, and that can cause injury to the stallion, especially if he's kicked in the, the gonad region, the, the testicles. Um, a, a good kick from a mare can certainly cause massive swelling and, and rule the stallion out for a good month and a half to two months um, if she's got a good aim. So there is also that risk of um, injury to the stallion. 
And if um, if she uh, if your mare um, is uh, going for live cover and the people do assisted live cover, so they hold the mare and the stallion, I certainly think if you're going live cover, this is the best option rather than just throwing your mare in the paddock with the stallion. Um, there's also the risk to the, the animal handlers that they can um, sustain injuries um, with having to be um, involved and um, with stallions getting a little bit um, carried away. So there's also the risk to um, handlers um, with injury. And the other uh, negative is, I suppose, semen quality. If you're doing live cover, you just don't get the ability to have a look at um, what the semen looks like and a lot of people don't swab their stallions or collect their stallions to make sure their fertility is good. Uh, and you can get a lot of subfertile stallions um, that you don't know that they're subfertile until you know they they um, have a few mares return negative in foal. Um, so semen quality is a little bit hit and miss with li some live cover um, stallions. So others can last up to seven days, which is brilliant. But um, on the whole, you you do you know question what his semen quality is like. Um, so the process with live cover, the mare should be scanned to determine whether you know she is in season or when's the best time to send her to the stallion. If you just turn up at the stud and throw her in the paddock, then they have the whole hierarchy and fighting issue, especially if she's not in season. Um, so this can increase the risk of, of being hurt. But if you are doing uh, assisted live cover, it's best to get your mare scanned um, and sometimes this can require one or two scans um, and then, then you've got an idea of exactly when the best time is to, um, to be covered. Um, again, assisted breeding is best uh, where the, and that's where the stallion is controlled and the, and the mare is controlled also. So um, this is the safest one for everyone involved. Um, and only there's only one cover required with live cover. A lot of people think that they need to leave their mare there for a few days so that she gets some you know good serves in. Um, but you only really need to if it's um, if your mare has been scanned for optimum breeding, you really only need one cover and she's done. Um, so some people use a teaser stallion, so you can, um, it's often the poor little Shetland pony or a miniature um, that they bring out and, and tease up the mare. Um, it can be a little unreliable this as some mares freak out when they see something little coming towards them um, and, and won't show to them. Um, anyway, um, and then other times they can be a bit overzealous to tease the stallions and um, they can put the mare off if they're overly loud and um, boisterous. So sometimes it's not as accurate. Your mare may be in season but just doesn't like the teaser. Um, and then we do recommend that the mare is scanned um, within two days of cover. And this is just to confirm that A, she's ovulated and B, that she hasn't reacted to the sperm or the pre-ejaculatory fluid, the, the sex uh, fluid that's put in with the sperm. So um, especially maiden mares do react um, for the first, first time. Um, and if that isn't settled down quickly, then often you've got to go back to the stallion because the, the uterus has still been a bit inflamed by the time the pregnancy comes, comes down into the uterus and decides to, to not stay, it's not a happy environment to stay. So um, maiden mares, it, this is very important to do that, that check. So the second technique is chilled semen um, and this is where the, the, the stallion is collected and put into a, a and basically shipped anywhere in country in a box. Um, you can have it um, from uh, New Zealand as well with flights nowadays and the travel time. You can get um, chilled semen from New Zealand but Europe and America and things like that, the semen um, is really only good for 48 hours. So by the time you consider a stallion being collected and put on a long haul flight, um, the semen would be pretty much dead by the time it's here. So we don't do chilled semen for international stallions. Uh, the pros for chilled semen is they have a great pregnancy rate, better than live cover. Um, so, uh, and that's mostly because the semen is processed and most of the pre-ejaculatory or the, the secondary sex fluids are removed. So you're really getting a high concentration of sperm in there without the rubbish and the dirt and all of those sorts of things. So they have a good pregnancy rate. Um, it's extremely safe for your mare and stallion. Um, in saying that, there's always the risk that um, during the uh, the ultrasound technique or the insemination, there is a low risk that um, potentially your mare could be perforated or, or torn um, through the uterus and rectum, but 
on the majority, the statistics are very low for that to happen. So in the scheme of things, it's less than live cover for um, damage. Um, and also it gives you the opportunity to choose stallions that just aren't in your neighbourhood. So you have the ability to choose stallions from all over the country, um, which can help with genetic um, pools and things like that. And then the, the risk of um, sexually transmitted infections is, is almost non-existent. So um, as long as the technique is clean um, and um, as sterile as possible, um, the, the chances of, collecting, uh, of contracting um, sexually transmitted infections is low. Um, the negatives to chilled semen is um, there are more costs involved, so does it require scanning and people um, to inseminate that know what they're doing? Um, they don't necessarily have to be vets, there are what we call AI technicians out there that will, um, that are able to inseminate your mare, um, uh, but you know, just knowing that they know what they're doing is, is important. Um, and the other thing can be semen quality, um, and I put this in here because sometimes semen goes missing and the courier, you know, the, the con is you are relying on couriers sometimes and um, we've, I couldn't count the amount of times semen has gone missing um, because a courier forgot to drop it off or um, we had one package come from Melbourne and it ended up in WA um, and we're in Queensland, so it um, got put on the wrong, or well, it came to Queensland but then got put on a different flight and um, ended up in WA. So by the time we got that semen, um, there was um, nothing live left in it. So um, there can be a, a problem with semen quality. Uh, some stallions as well don't travel very well. So as soon as you process them and add um, drink and energy drinks and stuff with them, they tend to shrivel up. Um, so sometimes this technique is not suitable for all stallions, but it's a very low percentage of stallions that um, don't cope with chilled semen. Um, so the process involved with chilled semen is um, your mare may need multiple scans to determine the optimum time to order semen. Um, most stallion owners like to um, have a 48 hours notice from when you need the semen because they need to travel to a vet or um, organise a courier and things like that. So we tend to um, be able to predict within three to four days of when your mare will need semen. Um, need to be organised um, because you need to often get, um, you know, the stallion owner to get the horse to the vet. Um, the vet then needs to be able to organise to collect the stallion and then you need to organise a courier um, and potentially flights. Um, so there is a little bit of organisation um, to, to do this process and, and some stallion owners do require um, a day or two's notice. Um, so once the semen is ordered, it arrives, um, your mare is prepared. Um, so when I say prepared, the rear end, um, the vulval area is cleaned up. Um, we use a special non-spermicidal lube um, and um, a glove is applied and, uh, and uh, AI pipette is used. And the AI pipettes are just basically big long straws with a special um, end that doesn't damage your mare. Um, the box arrives with the sperm, so then you remove the sperm uh, into a, a um, semen safe syringe and then insert through the vulva into the, uh, past the cervix and into the uterus and then the sperm is um, deposited just inside the uterus. Um, and then we usually examine them the next day to make sure they haven't reacted um, and, and can post-treat them. So potentially put some antibiotics in there if they've had a reaction or some anti-inflammatories to um, settle that down. Um, and then you usually wait for 14 days for a preg test. So the third technique is what we call frozen semen. Um, and this is where the stallion, um, his semen has been frozen by a special technique. Um, and it can be stored in liquid nitrogen for almost um, indefinitely. So as long as the liquid nitrogen canister is maintained, you can have frozen semen stored for decades. Um, the pros with frozen semen is it gives you access to a lot more well, worldwide, worldwide stallions. Uh, so it increases the genetic pool, um, which is fantastic uh, because we're an island. We, uh, if we just survived on our own breeding, we'd eventually have every horse inbred. Uh, so having access to the worldwide semen um, helps us a, a lot in that department. Um, it is safe for the mare and stallion as well. Um, 
for the, the process. Um, and the good part about it is your semen is stored until ready. So you don't have that um, the timing issue where you have to um, give 48 hours notice and things like that. So your semen is stored and ready at any time. Um, again, no risk of STIs. Um, they're just um, non-existent with frozen semen, so um, that's a very good positive. Um, they do have a good pregnancy rate, and that is just the pregnancy rate really depends on the quality of the frozen semen. Um, the a statistic out there is 80% of stallions that are frozen shouldn't be frozen, and this is purely because a lot of stallions sperm don't like the freezing process, so the cryogenic um, materials that are put in um, can often degrade semen quality. So as long as the semen that is frozen is good quality, then you have very good pregnancy rates. The reason frozen semen's pregnancy rates are quite low is because a lot of stallions are frozen that shouldn't be. So, um, And once you defrost their sperm and, and wake them up, they really don't have any energy and don't want to swim anywhere. So. Um, they have great pregnancy rates as long as the frozen semen is, is good quality. Um, and another thing nowadays is you can buy sex semen, so um, they um, by process of special light microscopes they can um, sex semen, so you can order um, semen that is um, filly or, or cult, um, which can be a pro um, for some people. Um, so the cons for frozen semen is it's certainly a lot more cost involved, there's a lot more scanning involved um, and a lot more hormones that are used um, and the semen quality can be variable as I said 80% of stallions that have been frozen shouldn't be. Um, so the quality can be very hit and miss and when you're talking about um, $18,000 for, for doses and things like that. Um, you want to be guaranteed that it's good quality so um, a lot of people claim to freeze semen and their quality just isn't there. So frozen semen, um, the process with frozen semen is there's a very small insemination window. Um, as you can imagine, because the sperm has been frozen sometimes for years, um, you have a you have to defrost the, the semen with a, a very uh, with a special technique. And once they wake up, the sperm can still be a little bit sluggish. So um, the you like to put the sperm um, into the mare at about um, either on ovulation or just after ovulation so that the sperm are there waiting for the egg once it's down into the fallopian tubes. Um, so there's a few techniques. We do multiple frequent scans, so every six hours we scan the mares. You can do a, a timed insemination where you uh, inject your mare with, um, with hormones and, um, and inseminate. Uh, inseminate twice. Um, I'm a bit of a believer of um, less drugs are, are better than more, so we do the uh, multiple frequent scans. So yes, I do get up at midnight and scan the mares. Um, we usually do 6 a.m., 6 p.m., midnight and midday, so um, that's what we tend to do in our clinic and we have um, great results with this. So um, we normally inseminate, inseminate sorry, just after ovulation. Um, and when a mare ovulates, um, it actually takes two hours for the, uh, sorry, three hours for the, the egg or the ovum to, um, to fall down into the fallopian tube where it then waits for the sperm. Um, and after insemination, sperm only takes um, two hours to get up to the fallopian tubes. Um, interestingly, there was a study done in Australia where they did, um, they, inseminated a mare and we have a, a process called deep horn insemination technique and that's where we put the AI pipette, a special AI pipette right up the, the either the left or the right horn depending on which ovary the mare has ovulated from so that the sperm don't really have to swim. So we basically place it where it needs to be and it just needs to sit there and wait for the egg. Now um, all sperm is, is male when um, when it's sperm, it's not until it meets the ovum that it then either splits to female or stays at male. So unfortunately, we all started as males. Um, but this this examination, uh, this experiment that they did, they did this deep horn uh, insemination technique. So all the sperm was put right up into the left horn, and um, this is an example of why um, 
males don't listen, so they were put there and it was basically that's where you need to stay. But 50% of that sperm were then found in the right horn. So 50% of that sperm had decided to swim around to the other side in case they were going to miss out on the other side. So even though you tell a male where to stay and just sit there and, and stay tight and the target will arrive, 50% of them still have to go and check everything else out. So um, I found that I found that amazing that um, research that um, that they did. So we still do do the deep horn insemination. Um, my theory is that the smart ones will stay there, so you'll you'll get the smart sperm. Um, highly don't think that's very scientific, but that works in my head. Um, so with frozen semen, there is a, a thawing technique. Um, you have to have the temperature of the water bath at a specific con uh, specific temperature, um, and the so the the straws are um, what the sperm is frozen into. Um, they're taken out of the liquid nitrogen tank into a warm water bath for 15 seconds and then put in a semen safe syringe and inserted into the mare. Um, and then we scan the mare the next day to make sure she hasn't reacted. Um, the chances of reacting to frozen semen is the, uh, sorry, the chances of reacting to semen is the highest for frozen semen and that's just because of the cryogenic um, material that they use to freeze the semen safely, um, some mares can react. So frozen semen is one of those um, techniques that if you're going through the process you must scan the mare the next day to make sure that she hasn't reacted um, excessively to the, to the other products in the sperm, uh, in the straws. Um, so they're the three techniques that are available to get your mare in foal um, and I just wanted to touch uh, touch over um, two other techniques that are out there um, and the first one is embryo transfer. Now embryo transfer is um, basically where you have a mare that you want to get a foal out of her but for some reason um, you don't want her to carry it or she can't carry it herself to full term so you take that pregnancy out of her and put it in a recipient mare or a surrogate. Um, so the pros and cons for this is the pros are there's no downtime for your donor mare so if she's a good competition mare and you don't want her to have 11 months off work or she's at a prime um, then this is you know this is a, a pro for some people they can get a foal out of her and she, um, she can still compete. Um, there's little risk to the donor mare so she's not going to have to go through the pregnancy and the birthing process so there's little risk of losing her to foaling. Um, another pro for some people, um, depending on your views on pro-life and things like that, some mares can have many foals in a season. Um, I think the the record, I think it, the Argentinians do a lot of this um, for polo cross or polo um, and I think the I think there's something like 14 foals out of the one mare in, in one season. Um, I don't know, it doesn't sort of sit right with me. I'm a bit of a traditionalist and you know mares are bred to only have one foal a year so um, but you can have you have the potential to get many foals out of um, one mare and I mean I suppose if she's a record-breaking polo mare and um, you know you might be able to make a bit of money by getting foals out of her but um, ethically I just you know that that is an option but um, some people do it so um, and the other really big pro is if you've got a problem mare so you know, uh, you can often get a mare that she'll get in foal, she'll be 14 days positive, but then when you go back for further scans, she just can't maintain a pregnancy. Her uterus just isn't isn't healthy or not, you know, just can't cope with having a pregnancy in it. So this is a fantastic um, scenario where you can get your mare in foal and then you know, take the pregnancy out and put it in a, in a surrogate mare that has has a good uterus or doesn't have any problems with hormone levels and things like that. So um, other times this can be um, good is, you know, if your mare has a medical condition like she's um, decided to get um, laminitis from an injury or she's injured um, and you know she can't carry a pregnancy herself but yet you'd love to get a foal out of her she's you know she's a valuable mare um, so you can often um, do embryo transfer for these types of situations. The negatives about embryo transfer is it does come at a cost um, and that can be anywhere from about two and a half to five or six thousand dollars so um, that can be 
a negative for a lot of people. Um, and there's also many pieces to the puzzle. So, you know, there's there's not just you've got to have a donor mare, but your donor mare has to be synchronised with your um, recipient mare. You've got to get your mare in foal first, so you may have to do chilled, uh, live chilled or frozen. Um, uh, so, you know, there's lots of pieces to the puzzle that can go wrong and then you've got to hope that your mare does fall pregnant so that when you flush you do get an embryo and then once you've got an embryo you've got to hope that the recipient mare accepts the embryo and then hope that that recipient mare doesn't have any problems and maintains the pregnancy through to, to 11 months or, or birth. So there's lots of things that can go wrong with embryo transfer. Um, and the, the pregnancy rate, um, success rate, is really quite high um, once you can harvest a pregnancy. So um, going into the recipient mare, there's often um, less issues once you've got the pregnancy. <clears throat> So the process with embryo transfer is you do need a donor and a recipient mare and they do need to have their cycles synchronised. So they need to ovulate pretty close to um, to each other within a, you want the recipient mare to either ovulate um, two days before or two days after your mare. So you have to be fairly confined with when she ovulates. Um, the donor mare, so um, the, the mare you want the pregnancy from, needs to be flushed at day six to seven post ovulation. So you have to be pretty specific about when your mare ovulated. Um, and then once the pregnancy is um, flushed, uh, which can only just sometimes be seen with the naked eye, but most of the times it's microscopic, it needs to be looked at through the microscope. Um, it's then implanted into the recipient mare, usually immediately. Um, you can have them chilled and sent to facilities that have recipients, or you can also tr um, freeze them and, and have them transported, um, or you know, freeze them and, and use them the following year. Um, and then the recipient mare um, is given hormones to maintain the pregnancy, usually up until about day 42 to 45, but um, sometimes they do require the hormones throughout the pregnancy. Uh, and this is often either orally every day or an injectable every five to seven days. Now, the new kid on the block, or I mean it has been around for a few years now, but it's only just starting to get a little bit more momentum in Australia, is what we call ICSI. Um, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is basically fertilisation in a test tube um, or in a petri dish. So uh, a bit like IVF in humans, um, where the eggs or the oocytes are harvested from your mare's ovaries um, and they um, are then injected with the sperm, um, so fertilised outside the mare and then either normally they're put into a recipient mare, you don't normally go through this process and then put it back into the mare. Um, so this can be fantastic for mares that don't conceive, so they can have fallopian tube issues or ovary issues that they don't release eggs. Um, this technique uh, is a way of being able to get foals out of that type of mare. Um, the, once the egg is fertile, or even before fertilisation, the egg can be frozen and stored later. Um, and the, the mare doesn't need to be in season. So this is something that can happen if, um, you know, if you've had a, a devastating injury to a mare and um, she needs to be euthanised or, um, you know, is, is progressively getting worse with a, a condition, then you can often, um, you know, harvest her eggs before she has to be euthanised and, and freeze them and, and, and still get foals out of her um, when she's no longer with us. So, um, you know, it can be uh, great for those sorts of things. Um, However, it is quite costly. Um, I think I'd have to double check, but I think it's about four to seven thousand dollars for that process. But it can be done. There's only a few places in Australia doing it. Um, we're fortunate in Queensland where there's at least two um, that are doing it in our area. So um, yeah, so that's quite uh, amazing to see. So the other things um, to think about when you're you know, when you're trying to decide on your stallion is when you're choosing your semen, there's a few questions you really do need to ask the stallion owner. Now the first question is how many foals does this stallion have on the ground? So how many mares has he gotten in foal that have foaled a healthy foal? Now the only trick to this question is you want to know how many foals that stallion has on the ground for whatever technique you're using. So some stallions have the option of live chilled 
or frozen semen. And if you ring a stallion owner and you're thinking about getting frozen semen, and you say to them, so what's, you know, how many foals have you, has it got on the ground? And they say something like 80 to 100 each year. You're thinking, that's pretty good. But what they're talking about is from live, uh, live semen. And if you're dealing with a stallion that is one of those 80% that shouldn't be frozen, you're thinking your odds are pretty good. But then when you get this frozen semen, you realise the quality is atrocious. So when you are asking the question of how many foals do they have on the ground, just at the end of that put with frozen semen, and you'll find those stallions that shouldn't be frozen, that number dramatically drops to about one or two a year. So it's really important to ask the right questions uh, when choosing semen because if you are deciding to go down the path of frozen semen, some of these stallions are in Germany and it's not a, when I say Germany, they're Europe or um, America, it's not a cheap exercise to have semen imported and, and then to find out its quality is atrocious, it's really heartbreaking to, um, to go through that process. So just asking the right questions is, is important when you're looking at um, breeding to a particular stallion. The other thing to think about is, you know, do they offer a live foal guarantee? So what this means is if your mare um, for some reason aborts or loses the foal or the foal doesn't last for 24 hours once it's born, um, they will give you a free return. So your mare will go, can go back to that stallion and go back in foal the following season. Now, you don't get this with frozen semen because frozen semen you're just buying doses of of semen and, and that's it. But with your chilled and, and fresh, you do get the ability to have a live foal um, guarantee. So sometimes that can help sway your decision. Um, and then the other thing is the semen quality. There's actually three factors that we look at um, for semen quality. Now, I don't know whether that's working or not, but um, no, I don't think it is, sorry. Um, we did have the video where you could see the sperm swimming, but for some reason it has decided not to work. Sorry about that. Um, so the three factors that we look at first, so the, video, the picture on the screen there is looking down a microscope. So that's all those little black dots are swimming sperm if the video was working. Um, so the three factors we're looking at is, the first one is concentration. So how much sperm is actually in the liquid that you're that you're getting. Um, you want the concentration to be 500 million sperm per mil. So you want a, a pretty high dose of sperm um, per, per ejaculate um, that, you know, that, that you put into your mare. And then of that concentration, you want to know how much of it is alive because every stallion um, ejaculates and, and some of the sperm can be dead. So that, that percentage of how much is alive um, really is important. If, you, if they're ejaculating a lot of dead sperm, then the mare's uterus reacts to dead sperm because they release chemicals and things that the, the mare's uterus reacts to. So live sperm is what you want. Um, so you want concentration. What of the concentration is alive? And then the third most important factor is of that that's alive, how much can, how many of them are moving in what we call a forward progressive motile fashion? So some sperm have kink tails or they have deformities and you'll notice they spin around in circles or wiggle around and they can't swim in a straight line. Now, if you want a sperm to hit a target, upper, upper um, uterus, upper horn and to a, fallopian tube, it kind of needs to swim in a straight direction because if it's ricocheting off the walls as it goes up, it's using too much energy and by the time it gets up to the end, it's, it's buggered and it, it doesn't hit its target. So of those, of how many can swim in a straight line? So they're the three things that we're looking for, concentration, um, live and then forward um, progressively motile sperm. So um, we uh, communicate this with our clients, so every um, chilled semen or frozen semen that we get, uh, we do look at this sperm and and, um, and have a look at those three factors. Um, the other thing to consider when you're choosing your sperm is the cost of the stallion. You know, some some stallions um, can be astronomical with their price, and if they've got poor quality semen and you're spending a lot of money, you kind of 
you know, not a happy camper when you when you realise you've paid a lot of money for a stallion. So it's really important to ask stallion owners the quality of their stallion. And it's not a rude question because it's your money. So um, if they are offended or can't answer your questions, potentially it's because they don't know or they're hiding um, that he's a subfertile stallion. So stallion owners are prepared for these questions. Um, so it's certainly not rude or unexpected to um, to ask these questions. So once, your, uh, once the insemination has taken place or um, the live cover has occurred, we can then, we then sit and wait for pregnancy to occur. Now pregnancy um, diagnosis can happen as early as 9 to 10 days post insemination or ovulation, um, but the most ideal time is 14 days because it's not um, it's quite a good size to see on ultrasound and um, it's much easier to find. So we do recommend a 14 day, uh, 14 to 16 day preg test because this is the most optimum time to determine if there's twins. Now mares aren't like cows and sheep and things like that, they're not built to have more than one pregnancy at a time. They, they do have a sort of a smaller uterus and pelvis um, and most mares if they do carry twins, um, you'll often get one live twin and one semi-form twin. Um, the worst case scenario is, scenario is you lose mum and both babies during the, the birthing process because they get a bit tangled up and, and don't come out one at a time and um, it can be an absolute disaster. So if your mare is a potential double ovulator which um, has the potential to be uh, a twinning mare, then this 14 to 16 day scan is imperative. Um, and if your mare has been um, diagnosed with twins, we just have a simple procedure where we um, we basically rupture one of the vesicles and then that does not continue um, and, and form a, a fetus. So um, we call it twin pinching um, and it's certainly the safest option for your mare. Um, if you do a twin pinch or a twin reduction after 17 days, this can put your mare at risk of losing the other pregnancy as well. So at day 17, the embryo, the little black dot on the left hand, the picture on the left hand side, um, up until day 17 it's floating all around the uterus having a good look at its, at its environment and deciding on where it wants to locate for the whole pregnancy. That happens at day 17 where we call that an implantation. So at day 17 the little black dot decides where it's going to stay and it implants into the uterine wall. So once this process has happened, if we then preg test after this and see that that implantation has happened, when you pinch one of the twins or reduce one of the twins that can cause an inflammatory response which then the mare gets a little confused and, and her body thinks she's losing both pregnancies and will often resorb the other pregnancy. So twin reduction is, is most successful before day 17 of um, gestation. Um, so other highlights, uh, day 28 is uh, another sort of scan that we do and that's when it's best to have a look at the heartbeat and the progression of the embryo which is the middle picture down the bottom. Um, do get the heartbeat at about 22 days um, but 28 days is, is it's a little bit easier to see and um, you get a much better idea of the, the pregnancy progression. Um, and then the other scan we do uh, recommend is what we call a 45 day pregnancy test. Now this is for a few reasons. Um, the first one is the horse is a, a bit of a unique creature in many ways but um, when they're pregnant most species um, the ovaries uh, release the hormone to maintain pregnancy which is called progesterone. Um, so we humans, we release it from our ovaries all the way through the gestation, through the pregnancy and, um, and then give birth. Where the horse, at day 42, the actual placenta or the, um, the organ, the the placental organ um, produces the progesterone from them so they don't rely on the progesterone from the ovaries at this stage. So once you get to 42 days, sometimes this transition can be an area where um, th there might be a problem and, and the pregnancy um, resorbs or doesn't continue. So we do recommend a 45 day um, ultrasound to just confirm that that 
happened and the pregnancy is still progressing. Um, and then this stage is the biggest, the biggest risk of losing the pregnancy is over by 45 days. Now all that has to happen is the embryo has to, you know, create a few legs and, 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 and um, um, you know, sort of um, quadruple or 200% increase in size. So um, the greatest risk period of losing a pregnancy is from insemination to 14 days. Um, and then it drops quite dramatically. So to get to a 14-day pregnancy, there's something like a you know 70%. Um, no, it's not that high. It's probably about a 40% chance of losing a pregnancy. And then from 14 to 28 days, it drops to about 18%. Um, and then from 45 days to birth is about you know two to five percent. So the biggest risk period of losing a pregnancy or your mare aborting or resorbing um, diminishes dramatically after day 45. So um, if the pregnancy is there at day 45, you only have a, sh a small percentage of, of mares that won't um, give birth to a, a foal. So in conclusion, um, there's three options for you if you do wish to go down the path of breeding and um, those options are fresh chilled or frozen semen. Um, and the, the best thing to do is to be able to scan your mare or ultrasound your mare to determine the best time um, to inseminate or cover. Um, and then we also recommend, uh, you know, an ovulation check and a, um, and if your mare has reacted to the, the sperm for optimum pregnancy rates, um, they, these things are, are highly required. Um, and then the pregnancy diagnosis, um, 14 to 16 days post cover is the most important one to do. If you only want to do one scan, um, we highly, highly recommend the 14 to 16 days post cover. Um, if you opt to not do the 28 and 45 day scan, that's completely um, up to you, um, but highly, highly recommend the 14 to 16 day post cover scan. Um, and then you basically need to wait for 11 months plus or minus a week and um, hope that that process um, goes smoothly. So just remember to breed for the right reasons um, and consider your facilities. Um, you know, foals are born with not much, um, not much intelligence. They don't understand that um, fences are to confine them and keep them safe. So if your fencing and things like that aren't appropriate, um, consider whether you need to have a foal. Foals have an amazing ability to lay beside fences or um, right next to you know yards and things like that and the amount of times we've had owners come home and find that the foal has fallen you know has woken up the other side of the fence and can't get back to mum um, or has rolled down a hill um, and, and foals are um, special creatures they're, they're verging on dehydration um, for the first sort of month of their life so uh, going without without fluids for four hours in a foal can be life-threatening so um, you know, you do need to have the ability to confine foals and, and mum and keep them safe um, and, uh, and and be able to house them for at least the first four months. Um, foals shouldn't be weaned before four months of age because their immunity is so naive. Um, so you need to be able to consider housing a mare and foal for at least four months. Um, and they do need exercise, so confining them in a small area is not often the best thing to do. Um, so just, you know, consider your your um, your housing and, and the the things you have available to you. So uh, and, and also, yeah, think about your mare and her um, her welfare as well. Um, so if she has medical conditions or, or problems arising, then potentially she's not the best option to breed from. So. Um, so now if we have any questions, now I did um, have a question regarding um, what's the, um, someone has a four-year-old and what's the best um, best option for them for breeding. So um, the younger the mare, sometimes frozen, well it doesn't even matter if, if your mare is a maiden, so it doesn't matter their age, but if they're a maiden mare, Often frozen semen is not your best option um, and this is purely just because of the increased costs with frozen semen. Um, if you have your heart set on frozen, you know the stallion is in Central America and there's no other option then just be prepared that you may need to do that 2.1 cycles before you get a pregnancy because frozen semen certainly does have the highest risk of 
fails for the first attempt in maiden mares. Um, mares that have had foals before seem to you know, be used to foreign things in their uterus and, and cope quite well. But if you have a maiden mare, um, certainly frozen wouldn't be my first choice. Um, and again, with with maiden mares, I um, as long as your stallion is, is the stallion you choose is, is a whiner and diner and, and gentle, I, I often see um, failures in live cover with maiden mares because they don't know what's going on. They often need sedation because they've got this thing roaring towards them with a massive erection and they don't know what's going on. So um, we often, you know, find a failure in live cover, but it's not it's not. Um, it's more so that the mare won't stand still for the stallion, or you know she reacts to the sperm. So if you're getting that post-service treatment, um, you know post-ovulation check and things like that, I think maiden mares um, cope really well. But if you just expect your a maiden mare to go in foal first go, um, you've got to be pretty lucky to get them first go. Um, so if anyone else has any, we've just. Um, running very short of time. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to email or put them on Facebook uh, and I'm more than happy to um, to answer any questions at any time regarding breeding. So um, this is my um, area of expertise. I um, absolutely love breeding. Um, so more than happy to um, answer any questions and if anyone has any problem mares or um, wants to discuss their cases, um, please feel free to put them on Facebook, whether you private message me or um, in the group. Um, would be wonderful. Okay everyone, thanks for your time and see you next time. Bye.